Hello and welcome to another edition of the Panthers Tracks Podcast. I'm your host, Ellis Williams, joined as usual by me, myself, and I. Hopefully I sound a little better today for y'all because I am in our podcast studio. That's right, I'm in Charlotte. The Panthers had Sunday off, which means I got to get back to the apartment and to our podcast studio here at the Charlotte Observer. So enjoy this because once I'm about to be on the road for a while here and it's probably not going to sound as good as the Panthers are in Spartanburg the next three days, practicing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They'll break camp ahead of FanFest, which takes place Thursday night at Bank of America Stadium at 7 p.m. before heading to Washington to face the Washington Commanders, a game that has a believe early kickoff yeah 1 p.m kickoff on the 13th then i'll go right from washington to new england where the panthers will have a joint practice on tuesday and wednesday of next week with the new england patriots ahead of their friday night game in new england against the patriots of course so that's a quick rundown of the Panthers' schedule and this likely podcast schedule, my life schedule in general. Honestly, there's no days off, and that's why we love this. I uh, hope the video looks all right. I'll never know where to stare at, but uh, this is different than watching myself on, on my Mac in a Zoom meeting that I do myself. So let's get into it. There's I haven't spoke to you guys in a few days because, uh, you know, with the Panthers practicing on Friday and Saturday, it, it makes, uh, excuse me, Thursday... No, yeah, Friday, Saturday. Yeah, they practiced yesterday. Wow, it's been a long couple of days. Um, it's difficult to get these podcasts up on the weekends. I'm going to try my best to change that once the regular season starts. We'll troubleshoot it during the preseason. we got some time here. A little over a month away from that first uh, game, September 11th, week one opener, when the Browns are coming to Charlotte to take on the Panthers. But as we look forward to the Panthers schedule their upcoming week in Spartanburg I think there's a lot to unpack and I want to give a state of the Panthers address as the Panthers head to again Spartanburg one last time for the next three days before they break camp there's a lot going on we're going to talk quarterbacks we'll talk injuries and we'll talk potential roster moves but as usual let's start with the quarterbacks we got a an update on when Matt Rule would like to name a starter after Saturday's practice, he said that he doesn't anticipate any position being ready to be named a starter or have a depth chart, uh, whether that's left tackle or quarterback or anywhere else. He doesn't anticipate that happening until after the Patriots preseason game, that week two game. I could see it dragging out further than then. I know that's not what fans want to hear, and we can get into any of this quarterback competition stuff makes sense but that's right out of Matt Rule's mouth and currently the timetable for when the Panthers would like to name a starting quarterback they're clearly in no rush they haven't been since this process started which is probably a natural segue into what this process even is in fairness I understood the quarterback competition coming in and I actually understood it more from an X and O standpoint, a procedural standpoint of that first week of practice. You know, Baker Mayfield admittedly only had the playbook for under two weeks before uh, coming to Spartanburg. And Sam Darnold, of course, had nine weeks of OTAs and three minicamp practices to start familiarizing and getting a hang of Ben McAdoo's system which meant that receivers like DJ Moore or running back Christian McCaffrey or tight ends Ian Thomas and Tommy Tremble were just ahead of where Baker Mayfield was at. So in order to not stifle your first team offense's growth that first week of camp, it made sense to give Sam Darnold a fair split of first team reps as he worked with the first team offense that were on the same level as him as Baker Mayfield played catch up. Now, as we're heading into the third week of camp, 10 days of practice, Baker Mayfield has really closed that gap. At least that's what Matt Rule has said. It 
seems apparent on the field that Baker is just with each practice getting more and more comfortable, more and more acquainted to this system. You can see in the command of his offense and the command of the, the huddle, the way he breaks it, the way he's barking at guys in two minute. Baker Mayfield is coming along quickly in this offense. I'm not sure how expansive it is, but just from a operational standpoint, you're not seeing any delay of games. You're not seeing them have to redo a rep because something was wrong verbiage wise or from a communication standpoint. This has been a pretty smooth camp for the quarterbacks before the whistle. And that tells me that Baker is right there with Sam now. So why are they continuing to split reps? Well, I can only theorize because Matt Rule continues to have no urgency in naming a quarterback, saying as early as Saturday that he's going to stick with what he said when camp started and that they'll know when they know about the quarterback, even when as far as said that it's not his job to name a quarterback, that the play will take care of that itself. I understand what he's trying to say, but he still is the head coach and the overseer of the practice time. He delegates where reps go and how to best maximize and run the most efficient practice as possible. And right now he clearly still thinks that the most efficient practice possible includes Baker Mayfield and Sam Darnold splitting reps, even though Sam Darnold's resume coming into this year was far superior, or excuse me, far inferior to Baker Mayfield's superior accolades in this league. And then just seeing them both at practice, Baker Mayfield's arm talent is as a tier above Sam Darnold's. He just attempts throws and completes throws that Sam Darnold doesn't even look for, whether that's by choice or nature, whatever it may be. Sam's not letting any of those rip. So we're, like I said, 10 days into practice. They're starting their third and final week in Spartanburg. Matt said they're nearing the end of a, their final installation phase. All great lingo, yet the competition continues. From a team building standpoint, I can see Matt's message here. The message being that no one comes to Carolina without earning their spot. No jobs will be handed out. It's a similar philosophy he's taking with left tackle Ika McQuanu, who though is repping more with the first team is still getting the majority of his reps at the second team tackle spot. Interestingly enough, that same logic doesn't seem to apply for free safety Xavier Woods or free agent guard Austin Corbett, but I digress, arguing myself out of my own point. Ha ha ha. Um, but Baker, at least for Baker and Ecom, they keep having to earn their spot. Again, from a team building standpoint, perhaps this team doesn't want to quote unquote lose Sam Darnold in the idea that you may have to turn back to him at some point this year if Baker Mayfield gets hurt or whatever that may be. I can't fathom why or how a team would prioritize a backup quarterback's emotional state when it's trying to maximize its wins. And quite frankly, the head coach is coaching for his job. But again, I'm just trying to organize all this in real time. And those seem to be the only two things that I can come up with that it's a, it's a good precedent or message to say, hey, look, you know, you have to earn your job here in Carolina. And then it, you're not going to lose a player by just not giving them a fair shot at the job. Um, from a functionality standpoint, we'll see if this works out long term because from a time rhythm and offensive consistency perspective it's difficult to justify allocating half of all your practice reps to an eventual backup but that's the panthers plan for the foreseeable future and we really <laughs> might not ask matt again what his plan is at quarterback until after the patriots game because he laid it out for us i mean we'll ask because it's our job but expect the same answer over and over again. 
with that being said, uh, some highlights from Saturday's scrimmage, if you will, the Panthers uh, had a unique practice. You know, they do every team does it every once a training camp, but essentially it was uh, as close to a live game as they'll get. No, no one's tackling, of course, so it's not live. But you know, they were simulating kickoffs, KOR, punt, field goal. Um, each time a new drive started, the quarterback would get the ball around the 20, 30, 40 yard line. There was a red zone session, you know, and have to convert a first down in, you know, four plays. They moved the chains, referees were there. It, it was as official as you could get without it being a real game, right? So what I remember, again, we're, we're only, we're a little more than 24 hours removed. Um, Baker Mayfield's touchdown to Rashad Higgins really stood out. I'll talk about the play first before I unpack what happened afterward. Uh, Baker dropped back and peeped Rashad Higgins' way, who was running what looked like a intermediate search or a hook route of some sort, looking to just find open space. When he noticed the DB who was occupying already the spot he was headed to, he decided to break his route deep and just take off for the, you know, the post. And whether it's Baker Mayfield and Hollywood Higgins chemistry from their four years together in Cleveland, or just Baker having his eyes up and making an instinctful play, he and Richard were in lockstep, mentally synced, and Baker let one launch for you know about a 50 yard score Higgins caught it in stride walked into the end zone kind of strided into the end zone and as he was reaching pay dirt he extended the football forward with both hands uh the offense ran down they were geeked celebrating Higgins busted out debuted his signature Hollywood red carpet celebration where he rolls out an imaginary red carpet adjusts his shoulder pads and does his runway walk, a smooth strut as teammates flash photos of him on their imaginary cameras. Baker Mayfield was all for it. Like I said, offense was geeked until Matt Rule's whistle started sounding. He heard a barking coming from about 50 yards downfield and he called his team up, huddled everybody up, mentioned some things about ball security and losing games and then had the offense run sprints sideline to sideline for Rashad Higgins extending the ball rather than keeping it tucked, which is a rule that, it, you know, if the ball, if the offensive player fumbles the ball in the back of the end zone, the defense recovers at the 25 yard line. So I get where Matt Rule is coming from, from a team teaching standpoint, is that the best way to handle what was literally the most electric moment of Panthers training camp thus far? Could you get your meet, your point across in a different way? Yeah, he acknowledged after practice that, you know, every coach, I'm paraphrasing and inferring here, um, every coach sort of premeditates when they're going to lay into their team just to make sure intensity stays up. He was upset that the defense let a player get behind him, and he was upset that the offense, quote-unquote, began celebrating before the play was over. Thus, the team runs and... Everyone gets yelled at. This became a a thing on Twitter. It will continue to be a talking point as you just you know monitor the team, the offense's high points going forward. Speaking as someone who has covered Rashad Higgins and Baker Mayfield for two and a half, three seasons, they both are players that thrive on the on swagger plays like that. They need the confidence. They have to think they're the best quarterback or wide receiver in the world to play like a capable quarterback and wide receiver. And Matt Rule really sucked all the momentum and confidence out of that moment. I don't think he, who knows what it, if it will mean anything long term for the team. You'd think that you'd have a talented and mentally strong enough group that this doesn't have long-term effects, but you know, I've never broke down or analyzed a post-play, not really post-play, but like post-play events of a training camp practice like I am this, but 
that's the uh, the ins and outs, the highs, the lows, the fun and complex experiences of covering the Carolina Panthers this year as Matt Rule is in his third year coming off back-to-back -back five win seasons and facing a hot seat where it's kind of just playoffs or bust at this point. Uh, the rest of the scrimmage was uneventful. Uh, a couple punts. Zane Gonzalez made all his field goals. I believe the, the team started him out there five different times. Uh, Baker Mayfield had stretches of going five for five for a score. That was his stat line on that Rashad Higgins drive. Um, he had less than impressive drives before that. Uh, once going two for five. Sam Darnold throws one touchdown, got off 28 pass attempts. Um, you know, I'm going to keep saying the same things about Sam. Like, we, we know what he is. And there's days where he's really efficient and then hits some intermediate routes and takes off a little bit. And you're like, okay, yeah, that was Sam's best day. And then there's days where it's just pedestrian and you think, okay, P.J. Walker could have done that. Baker's average days are comparable to Sam's best days. Baker's best days don't register on Sam Darnold's barometer. He, he, he just ha hasn't had a day like Baker. He hasn't really attempted a pass over 40 yards, 30 yards. So this competition still to me seems like it's Baker Mayfield's to lose. Baker has created fair, decisible separation between him and Darnold, I believe. But according to Matt Rule, we still got two weeks, 13 days, 12 days left in this, depending on when you're listening. So we will, of course, keep you posted and locked here on the Panthers Track podcast. Some things I want to get to before we get out of here, because, uh, you know, we'll get you, we're going to get back to daily podcasts here as, as we head towards a new week. Um, just some injury update. Shaq Thompson remains in the PUP list. Nothing's changed there. The team does not expect him to participate in training camp, but all expectations point towards him returning for week one against the Browns. J.C. Horn remains day-to-day -day with a foot injury. This is me inferring something. This is not a quote or any language from the team, but I think J.C. had a minor setback only because he was in pads for two days before returning back to idle and not dressing at all for practice. Matt Rule's considering him day to day, but I just don't like the optics of a guy coming off the PUP list, starting with individual drills, warming up on the bike, and then two days later he's back to essentially being on the PUP list, even though that's not what the team has done. But you know, when you're not in pads, you're not. What's the difference? So um, I'm inferring that as a minor setback. That's not language the team has used. Uh, C.J. Henderson rolled his ankle Thursday. Matt Rule said this team's getting thin at corner. Um, he is also someone they're going to evaluate after about a week. And, you know, this happened middle to late of last week. So I think we'll, I mean, we're going to ask about CJ on Monday. Um, but I'm guessing, you know, he'll maybe you see him at FanFest. I don't know. That would be exactly a week. Uh, Keith Taylor, hamstring. He's still out one to two weeks. This is, a, you know, one of those soft tissue things that they're not going to really know until he opens it back up again. The team ideally would like to have Dante Jackson. CJ Henderson on the side, or excuse me, outside, and then JC Horn manning the slot. And that's interchangeable, of course, but they, they really would like to play, put JC as close to the ball as possible just to allow him to be in the, the run game and just, you know, lock up and create chaos. Uh, Keith Taylor projected to be the team's number four corner. Uh, but now, you know, guys like Chris Westry are getting a real shot. Westry was out there with the ones a lot on Saturday. He's long, 6'5 corner, played at Baltimore last year. He looks good. You know, he you really like his physical traits, and so far, he's, you know, I haven't seen him you know, out of position or really been tried all that uh, as challengingly against DJ Moore or Robbie Anderson. Perhaps a team would scheme against him and, and really eat him up in a game setting. But that's what preseason for. We're about to find out. Uh, the team has signed Duke Dawson, and Tay Hayes, one of those, to make one of those restrooms, the team had to cut Thomas Fletcher, of course. Uh, they drafted him with a six round pick a year ago, and never expectations that he would eventually replace JJ Jensen, but that position battle is over as they cut Fletcher, and Jensen will 
be the team's launch center this year. He's only 13 games away from passing John Casey for the most games played in franchise history, so we will likely get to that this year. Uh, but with Fletcher gone, that's Jansen's job, and that allowed the team to add some DBs, Duke Dawson being one of them, but he's already in a red jersey as well, which means he's not practicing. Hayes had an interception on Saturday, picked off Sam Darnold on a nice play. Uh, he was on the team's practice squad last year and is uh, now competing for a roster spot. Terrace Marshall is dealing with a calf. He's day-to-day. -day. Matt said that we'll probably see him back this upcoming week, but he's a guy who I think has been leading all Panther receivers in reps before he popped up on the injury report through the first six days of camp. Marshall was the first receiver out there behind DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson in two receiver sets. He's made several memorable plays, including that 30 yard reception from Sam Darnold, which was the throw of camp up until uh, Baker Mayfield hit Robbie Anderson on a, on a deep post touchdown. And then before this Rashad Higgins play Baker with two of the three best plays of camp. Matt Rule said he's got a lower leg strain. Shouldn't be too long, but he's going to be out for a little bit. And then Marquis Haynes, which is we got a big update today. The team announcing that Haynes avoided any significant knee damage after suffering that left knee injury during the Saturday practice. He was helped off the field and later carted away. Like I said, he went down in 11 on an 11 on 11 drill. The, you know, starters on the defensive line went over and, and said a prayer for him. Uh, there was real concern that he was going to miss some time. But with him now considered day-to-day -day as the Panthers head into a Monday practice, the team is, again, not going to be all that urgent to sign a pass rusher. I thought with Haynes out, uh, they would look at a Jason Pierre-Paul or Everson Griffin, just, you know, veterans. Tack McKinley, I think, is a name that's interesting. Uh, but now with him back in the lineup, or at least day-to-day -day and likely returning soon, uh, it doesn't sound like the team is in any rush to address the edge position. I think they will eventually, maybe after that first preseason game, maybe after the second preseason game, but not anytime soon. All right, I think that's going to be about it. It's late on a Sunday night. Cranked out two stories today. We're back up early tomorrow, making that drive to Spartanburg. Probably will be in rush hour traffic, jam, bumper to bumper construction. I, I love the commute, you can tell, can't you? All right, y'all, I'm out of here. For Ellis Williams, I'm signing off for the Panthers Tracked Podcast. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back tomorrow.